The world is always on, but you shouldn't be. Put junk sleep to bed. During Mattress Firm's sleeping spree event, save up to 50% on ceiling. With queen mattresses starting at $349.99. Only at Mattress Firm. Restrictions apply. See store or mattressfirm.com for details. O'Reilly Auto Parts specializes in keeping your car on the road. Not sure how much life is left in your battery? Our professional parts people will test it for free. If it does need to be replaced, we'll help you find just the right one to fit your car. Our superstar batteries are built to handle even the toughest conditions. Visit O'Reilly Auto Parts today. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Da, 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 da. Can you tell which episode starts with those notes? <laughs> if you said all of them, <laughs> you'd be right. Hello, everybody. I am Barry Williams, and you are Christopher Knight. And we are the real Brady, Brady Bros. Bros. Welcome to another podcast episode where we dissect, bisect, and take apart every episode one at a time from our five seasons of The Brady Bunch and go behind the scenes, flush them out. We're going to talk about what they meant, uh, why they uh, resonate, uh, how differently they would be written if we wrote them today, and who guest starred in them. So get set for some fun. And uh, for this uh, week, we selected an episode called A Fistful of Reasons. Fistful of Reasons, yes. This episode aired November 13th, 1970. It was the eighth episode of season two, the 33rd overall Brady episode that aired. This episode for me had some uh, interesting correlations to my private life. <laughs> oh, you were a hero. You you were a hero in your private life as well. Well, that was that the, the hero. That's another yeah. episode we haven't yet discussed. But when we come to that, we will find out that had nothing similar with my real life. But this did. Yeah. This did, and we'll get to that because okay. no one has ever brought it up to me. But something I won't say it right now. Something stands out. In this episode, I mean, oh, there are a few things. There are a few I mean, things. But that stand for me, when episode. I, I mean, that just looks like like something bad that's it never dis discussed. So it could have been plucked from your real life. Well, it was. It was covered up by makeup. Something from my real oh, life. I can't was wait. Covered up I, by actually, makeup. I think I know what that was because you uh, you look pretty funny there, Jimmy Durante, there for a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this show is rich. This show has a lots of stuff going on because there is fighting, there are excuses, there is mimicking, there is perhaps, I don't know if we won't say a battered wife syndrome going on here, but I would say that it would border on a dominated wife syndrome. All kinds of things that were interesting, including guest stars, the bad guy, the tormentor, Cindy's tormentor, was uh, played a bad guy in lots of TV shows uh, during that time. So why don't we jump in here, starting with the credits. Isn't it great? Just, we're already in the second season. We're singing, the Brady Bunch kids are singing our own theme song. Now, this was one of the first times that was ever done. And well, let me ask you, I don't, I don't recall what brought that about. I mean, clearly they had an idea to hire someone to sing the opening song to the Brady Bunch, and they did in the first season. How did? How was it that somebody convinced them that we should sing it, or whose idea was it? Do you recall? Uh, I do recall what I had heard and was told uh, by Lloyd was that it was Lloyd. Uh, Lloyd Schwartz, Sherwood Schwartz's <laughs> son, uh, has taken full, uh, full credit for this, and he thought, hey, look, we, you know, this show is about the kids. Why not have the kids sing their own theme song? And, and it seemed to be, uh, you know, reasonably within everybody's range, even though I had to sing harmony at the end of it in order to uh, stay in tune. I stood far back yes. so that uh, <laughs> as to not disrupt the flow. 
yeah. uh, that everyone else generated. But we were one of the first shows ever to sing our own theme song, and I thought that was pretty cool, such as it was. How many times did we do it? We didn't do it every year. We just did it twice? I know we recorded and then re-recorded it at least once, so twice, I think is right, over the five years. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I guess we sounded too young by the fifth season to have the same recording. So. Well, I just think our, our voices had all really sharpened up. They've, we'd gotten our pop edge on by that point. Yeah, speak for yourself. Here's the story of a lovely... All right, so what is this episode about? And this is not a very Brady-type episode, if you really think no, about it. No, it's really I not. Mean, there are a few. I mean, usually we have a really simple moral we can go to, something like not just the family, but society ahead. This, not so much. Not This not is a sure really sophisticated that. show. You know, as I'm looking at it, because... We recently did Is There a Doctor in the House and watching it. And again, I didn't watch A Fistful of Reasons since it's been 40 years, maybe, since I've seen this episode. Of course, I remember doing parts of it, but they're both rather sophisticated that the second year's shows were dealing with some issues around which we would depict Mike and Carol as Rather modern parents, Very wouldn't you modern. say? I Very mean, that Carol was 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 not the type of mom that had been, you know, uh, uh, prevalent uh, through the fifties. You know, how, how like, do you mean that? How do you mean uh, that? Well, like the the wife bringing the drink home to the dominant male. She was a co-parent in the children's life. Not either the only parent, that the father never really spoke to the kids and that was the job of the mom to rear the children, nor the dosing of, of advice, you know, it was. And in this particular case, it comes really clear, you know, that this is a show about bullying and then trying to stand up for oneself, that the, it's going to come from the father, you know, a person. Florence Henderson was in real life, very close friends with Helen Reddy. So there you go. I am woman. Hear me roar. Maybe that was what was going on there. Well, you know, Florence had this in her, yeah, actually, yeah, as a don't. person. So let's discuss this plot. I mean, well, one, one we... thing I, I do want to talk about, I need to give some props to Susan Olson here, Cindy. Susan was the first child that was cast by Sherwood Schwartz. He fell in love with her immediately. And you can tell by the pilot and the way they put the star filter on her. They, he just loved her and I thought she was great. Little did Sherwood know that uh, Susan Olson would have like next to nothing in common with Cindy Brady, but... She certainly looked the part. And this kind of plays that one up because one of the things that came with the Susan Olsen package was her lisp, which was authentic and real and something that she had to deal with, not just on the show, which they kind of, you know, like they made it really cool, but uh, but off screen as well. And this show deals quite a bit with that lisp. You know, what? let me lay this out for our audience out there. So when um, an actor is called in uh, to do a movie or, you know, uh, it might be that the director is casting someone that he doesn't know. So it's not like a friend of his that he knows really well. The actor is performing a role that a writer has written and the director has adopted and they're looking for something. When you do a series like this, that's how it's cast, at least on the front end. But as we'll see in this episode, there are parts of us very clearly in Susan's case, the Cindy character is a lisp that is then utilized by the creators of the show to write around and to. So very much over time, our personas became our characters. And I'll use this as that example. I bet that an episode around a lisp was something that was absolutely going to happen after Susan was cast. Yeah, sure. No doubt. No doubt about it. Was it was going to be coming. Yeah, because he just, thought it was adorable. Just like they taught me, just like in this episode, Greg teaches Peter how to box. Now, we have a little story about that that is so far off this episode. I'm not going to spend time with it, but because many, no, many now years I'm later. Now I got to hear it. That's what our show's for. That's what 25 years later, you were asked oh. to <laughs> box Danny Bonaducci. <laughs> On celebrity boxing. And I was and, smart enough to say no. And I'm thinking that Danny Bonaducci is still this little pudgy kid, you know, and I've, I know I've got a reach on him. And I didn't know that he was a black belt. I didn't know that he was, a, that they used to kick him out of the gym for spending so much time there. And in comes this, this, this. Uh, Nor did you know he was off his lithium. Yeah, well, there was the, there was the lithium and there's also the steroids. And uh, uh, it was like amazing. Uh, yeah. But anyway, I ended up in the ring with him licking my wounds anyway. So uh, in this episode. 
episode, I teach you how to box. <laughs> yeah, and you and you look good in comparison to me. But at the time, I'm only what just twelve years old, maybe not even, probably two months, three months from turning twelve. So I'm eleven years old. I don't know how to box. I don't. I've never been in a fight. Neither had Peter. But which, the, which they know, wrote purposely into the episode because they knew that you, you know, ran from fights all the time. <laughs> Did you have any, do you, uh, in this show, let me tell our audience, it's, uh, that Carol actually uh, enunciates that she is from Swampscott, Massachusetts. Now, I'm buying it, right? In the episode, she says it in a way that maybe it's truthful and maybe it's not. But well, I don't know, I don't actually, remember. Actually, if, the way that she said it was not Swampscott, Massachusetts. She said it, she was from Swampscott, Massachusetts. So it was a joke. Because it was a joke, was she present as Carol making a joke? I don't think so. I think that because it was much worse for her growing up with the list because she was from Swampscott, Massachusetts, was truth. But then again, I'm a literal kind of person. Well, I think we should call Tam Spiva and see if we can get a hold of him somewhere. Well, do you know of any other episode where she comes out with, where Carol comes out with where she's from? And it, does it contradict that? I don't. But if, folks, if uh, any of you can come up with the answer to Christopher's question, please contact me at uh, barrywilliamsofficial.com and let us all know. We'll get it on every Brady site imaginable and give you credit. We'll have to ask Susan when we see her next. <laughs> yes, yeah, she, she'll know. Because she may know. So so also in our episode is a way to parent that comes or leaps right straight from uh, the time in which we were produced, which probably wouldn't be the way a parent would raise a child today. At one point, when we find out that Cindy in this episode comes home from school very unhappy, crying, hurt, having been bullied at school, as it turns out, because of her lisp. She was teased. This is baby talk, baby talk. It's a wonder you, you can, can walk. walk. By the horrible, horrible Buddy Hinton. The Bud evil. Buddy Hinton. Ooh, who, 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 Child who, heavy. Who, who I just want to point out right here at the beginning while we're talking about this episode. Always, every time we see Buddy Hinton, always is standing by the same tree at the same place at the same sidewalk, doing absolutely nothing at all whatsoever. Easily so that, avoided in real life. So that Cindy can walk by and get teased again. Right. <laughs> Take a different path would be one of the morals of this story, I guess. That's, that's true. <laughs> but we wouldn't have a show. How inconvenient. <laughs> when mom and dad discover from Cindy that she's been teased because of her lisp, her lisp is pronounced not for mom and dad. It's no secret. They know it's a lisp. Dad says it's just a lazy S. Mom and dad are not upset at this point. And I don't know if a regular parent would be at, I mean, what's she playing? Six years old at this point with a lisp. I don't know when it is that one starts speech therapy for someone that has a lisp, if it's not going away. But I guess you have to wait for them to grow up more to know that it's not going away before you introduce them to that kind of It work. depends on how much money you're making for having the lisp. <laughs> talking about the you're character. Still, making, still talking take, of, making money at 18, you keep it. <laughs> well, okay, so that's what that, Carol and Mike were interested in having a second income, and in the, they're sounding more yeah. and more like my folks, you yeah. know, as we talk, okay. as we talk about. But the, here's a, a moment where Carol is very kind and understanding and, and shares that she had a lisp when she grew up, which mm -hmm. is a wonderful way of supporting your daughter who's feeling less of themselves because of this lisp. Mm -hmm. And then she goes on to say, yeah, I, I used to have a lisp when I was your uh, child, but now... I say things really swell. And she nice. says it just like that. She nice. says it with the list. Like, like she's <laughs> providing empathy and a secure place and then teasing. Like just when you think she's being self-deprecating, she's really teasing her daughter. Right. Anything for the joke, even, you know, yeah. probably a display of bad parenting. So I thought that was interesting that today, even though comedy writers will always go for the joke, the joke would have been removed from the show. <laughs> It was like, let's not treat our child. Let's not make fun of our child. Very true. Very true. And then what's interesting is the boys jump in to try to help. Oh, you know, even before then, there's one interesting thing, and I don't know what happened, and maybe you can explain it. You were at this point, this is 1970. How old are you? I am 16. Ah, so you're driving in. Well, not yet, uh, because... This is at the beginning of the summer, and I turned 16 at the end of the summer. But I'm driving with my mom. At, I am actually the driver, but driver, you know, with learner's permit. Either there was a scene cut out or some part of the original script that didn't make it into the final edit. Or you showed up to work late. Because as Cindy comes home and is upstairs, then mom and dad call for dinner. And down the stairs comes Peter, Bobby, Marsha, mom and dad. 
see them all run down the stairs after calling dinner and see that Cindy and Jan aren't there and ask Marsha where they are. Marsha says Jan is washing up and Cindy is not going to come to dinner. There is no mention of Greg. Interesting. At all. I, on, like honestly, you were lost. I, do not know. I don't know the answer to that. But for any of our listeners out there, if you know the answer to this and more, please contact me at Barry. Don't get me going. <laughs> don't get me going. I can make up stories about where you were. <laughs> yes, I might have been on the Bonanza set. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe you were on the lot, but you were late to makeup. Then right. they completely forgot to add you. Uh, you know, there was supposed to be some mention. Maybe there was a, you were passing mom and dad in the kitchen and that part got cut out. Yeah, but uh, yeah. so then the boys try to help Cindy by reading her tongue twisters or introducing her to a tongue twister book as a way of helping. I'm not sure that's yeah. exactly the way you help someone with a list. I don't either. All you get to do is just hear yourself lisping. I mean, how does that? I don't. Well, it's great to, for comedy. It's great for yeah, the writers. Well, that's true. That's true. They did come up with with like the seven silver swans swim silently seaward, you know, or someday I'll speak swell. Well, they're or, so tough, even Alice can't do them, right? It's Alice sells seashells down by the seashore. Try to say it fast. It's not about a list. I think you just did. It's <laughs> terrible. Anyway. She sells seashells down by the seashore. Can you still hum every 80s pop melody or tap the beat to the all-classic 90s hip-hop tracks? Whatever decade of music is your true love, you can prove it with the world's biggest music quiz game on Alexa. We play you a clip, and you guess the song and artist. Just say Alexa, play song quiz to try it now. Test yourself, your family, and your friends with music from any decade by saying Alexa, play song quiz. That's Alexa, play song quiz. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. O'Reilly Auto Parts specializes in keeping your car on the road. Not sure how much life is left in your battery? Our professional parts people will test it for free. If it does need to be replaced, we'll help you find just the right one to fit your car. Our superstar batteries are built to handle even the toughest conditions. Visit O'Reilly Auto Parts today. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. You mentioned something earlier. What? That is very true. Sherwood was enthralled with this list. He thought it was really cute. And that wouldn't be something that Susan liked at all. I mean, in other words, as no. a person, she didn't no. want no. to sell the lisp, overdo the lisp, but she had one. Yes. And she still well, she still has a bit of one today. Well, Susan was, you know, she kind of came in as a little package there, don't you think? I mean, uh, curls the, and Lisbon, the girl, yeah, the curls, the lips, the blonde hair, and uh, you know, ready to do a tap dance at a moment's notice. But the person inside of Susan was waiting to come out. She knew it was people making fun of something that she didn't have complete control over. So in in the real time, we were tormenting her. In the way that this episode is depicting a bully tormenting yes. her. Well, there you go. A little more hard. reality than even we had bargained for on that. It's interesting that no one saw that. That the intent, I guess, is all they cared about. The intent of the tease was much more important than the effectiveness of bringing well, attention to it. And to add to your point, what the writers don't understand and, and uh, you know, the big machine of television uh, doesn't care about is that she has to go back to school when we finish filming. In fact, she goes back to her regular school about the same time that this episode airs. And so she's now back in school being made fun of for teasing. And now she's catching flack for that in school in real time when, like, she's not getting paid for it. All I know is a couple months later, after this episode aired, I was sort of like big man on campus because, you know. Well, because you're the hero in this thing. That's what I was trying to I say. Because I got a vicious left hook, which was really a left cross. I mean, what do I get out of this? All I can tell you is that uh, I'm going to take credit for uh, showing you how to throw your left hook, which I have just learned is really a left cross. I think I'm right about that. I don't know. Somebody out there who knows, you know, who's a boss. We'll, yes. we'll talk to Danny. Bonaducci would know because he, and you know. Yeah. Please contact me at barrywilliamsofficial.com. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> All right. So the thing that I was uttering up front that no one noticed or no one's ever asked me about. I'll ask uh, you about I it. see like? apps. Okay, so did you see anything strange about me and my appearance throughout the show? Well, Yeah. What was it? Yeah, well, uh, you, you know, I wish we were doing a, a Zoom podcast so we could just do a little close-up on your schnoz. 
and see what just what the heck was going on there. I thought you were growing a beard out of the top of your nose. Was that if anybody out there has a dog, like a small puppy that has a black nose? That's what I was turning into. It looked like I was going through some kind of like werewolf metamorphosis nose first. <laughs> nose What's first. interesting to me is <laughs> no one has asked me about it. Like it was normal. But what that was, was... Chris, can I interrupt you for a second? Okay. There's something about this episode I've always wanted to know. There was something going on with your nose. Could you explain <laughs> that for me and tell me about it? So happy you would ask. Oh, okay. Sure. So I, I had a very contentious relationship with my brother, who is only 13 years older than me. Um, and we had a... Your brother's 13 years older than you? I did say years, didn't I? Yeah. No, that was, that's a rambling of, yeah. <laughs> of more than a middle-aged mind. No, okay. 13 months older than me. You so we're a, rather close. We had a were brother too, I didn't know about. It. In yeah. age, we were, we were too close and competitive. And he was always bigger and would always get a lick in on the nose. And as he, he licked your nose? And as he was turning, I'd get him in the kidney. What? So we would get in fights all the time. You'd hit now, him in the back? <laughs> I, matter of fact, growing up, even before we started throwing oh, fists, man. it was the scratches. I'd have big gouges out of my face from his fingernails. He admits, he, you know, when we were in the crib together, because we shared a crib, and he has to recognize that what he was trying to do was snuff me out. True. That really was what he was trying to do. <laughs> it was, and if you learn about, you know, like we raised pigeons, so I learned about birds and the whole idea of a pecking order. It's really real. Birds are born at different times. The, the eggs hatch differently and they grow so fast. One is big, one is little. Let's face it, Chris, before you came along, he had that old crib to himself. He did. And right. I and I, and I crimped his style. Uh, yeah, you cr you cribbed, his, cri uh, cribbed his style, yeah. <laughs> Any okay. case, we, we got in fights so often that, and he popped me in the nose so often that I couldn't sit upright without getting a bloody nose. But those bloody noses... So with all the money that you're making now with the Brady Bunch, why didn't you just get another crib? <laughs> You're actually thinking about that. I'm because where is he going? See, he, you, this is people, this is Barry being a, ten years a later. Comedian. <laughs> I, love, anyway, I love you. So, I love that you're even pondering that. Go ahead. <laughs> well, isn't it ironic though? What's this show about? It's about fist flying. And the week of this show, we do one day of the show, I believe, because we are, we're on a three day schedule. And we did a Friday and a Monday and a Tuesday. I had, because it would it was getting so bad, the bleeding, and it wouldn't stop. Once it started, I'd have to lay down for 20 minutes. That doesn't really work with our schedule. No. no. Right? No matter so how much we tissue had to, you're shoving up your nostril. We had to start to do something about it, uh -huh. and that thing was to go into the doctor on Saturday mm -hmm. and get my nose cauterized. I have one question for you. Was it a male doctor or a female doctor? Uh, this, was, uh, this was a male doctor. Oh, you see? A life imitating art again. Very okay. similar to getting a COVID swab, but dissimilar in that this thing hurts like hell. It literally, they put the silver nitrate up your nose and burn your nose. Sounds like fun to me. But they don't tell you that what's going to happen is not only is the inside of your nose going to turn all black, but your whole lip's going to turn black. Oh. And it burns everything. It that was burns. a silver nitrate nose? That was a cauterized lip, nose, and everything. And I come in on Monday, this just happened on a Saturday, and they have to figure out how to make me photographable. Don't they have makeup people for this? They did, but that's what you see, is me in makeup. And it still bleeds through, like there's something going on with this nose. Your close-ups are quite different than mine. I don't have any. We knew that if I didn't get it done in that scene, my nose would have been bleeding profusely just from moving. So wow. just, just, just the swinging of the fists and so forth. I would have had a bloody nose the entire day. You were bold then. But I thought it was really ironic that here's this episode. It is. It's going to be the reason that I'm going to have to get my nose cauterized. I knew all about kind of being physically uh, bullied <laughs> and then having to stand up for myself. All right. Back to the episode. Back. Baby talk, baby talk. It's a wonder you can walk. Now, who is this guy? This Buddy Henton, this personality hanging out at the tree by the sidewalk, like three times Cindy's size. Big bad dude is what Big he is. Bad dude. Yeah, right. Okay. And Russell Shulman. 
is his name, Russell Shulman, did a great job in this, I think. Just well, he had played this role apparently before. He was literally typecast into always being That's true. a bully. That's true. I, in fact, I saw him on one of the uh, the late Andy Griffith shows where he was playing. They didn't call him Buddy Hinton, but it was the same guy, younger. And, and so, you know, that's, that's exactly, Chris, how people get typecast. Because you play a, a role as a, a tormentor or a bully in an episode of a TV show. And then every time a bully comes up that's the right age, whether it's on the Paramount lot or the Universal lot or the Warner Brothers lot or Disney, wherever it is, the the casting director goes, oh, well, you know, we've got a we have a client here who, uh, you know, plays a good bully and he just did it on the Andy Griffith show. So you're going to want to have him on the Brady Bunch. And that's right. And then the director says, get me Russell Shulman. He's I, just do it just like he did it on this episode. Now, that of course, episode. as as like a, an eleven year old, when he goes back to school, uh, you know, his life is you know he's, he's tormented. Well, yeah, he's tormented because his now his tooth is loose and he's lisping. You're ahead of us here on the on the show. <laughs> Anyway, so he's teasing uh, Cindy. She comes home. She wants a little help from mom. Well, actually, she doesn't want to tell anybody. She doesn't want to come down for dinner. Isn't that, isn't that what happens? She doesn't yeah, she didn't want to come down for dinner. But now, what mom... I love about this, she doesn't want to come down for dinner. So who goes up to soothe her? Not mom, not dad. Both mom and dad at the same time. Drop everything. You know, dinner gets cold, everything. We both go up and now we have a... T- a well, let's uh, not go that far. I don't think dinner got cold. You weren't even there. So what do you care? For Mike and Carola did. <laughs> they're up there talking about Cindy and trying to find out what our problem is. And there's something wrong with that? Don't we all wish that we had that kind of attention? Absolutely. That's, that's very Brady. Ide- that well, very we, Brady. The Bradys are idealized. But it would be nice if mom and dad were involved in every decision. I think my father was so intent on my growing up. His his idea of a solution for my problem was, hey, uh, hey, kid, just get into your room and to cry it off, all right? And come out when you're done. My dad wouldn't even have known I was crying. Oh. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, it's yeah, somebody else's job. So Susan comes clean. She tells everybody that she got teased at school for lisping. So then we get the book to try and help her. That's ridiculous, right? Right. And, and, we doesn't uh, help. So what happens is we have the idea of logic and cool reason as a way to overcome this problem. It is revealed that now Peter's involved with this problem child, Buddy Hinton, because Peter was escorting Cindy by Buddy Hinton when he teases Cindy and Peter says to stop doing that. And then Buddy Hinton starts going at Peter and tells him that if he wants Buddy Hinton to stop teasing Cindy, he'll have to stop Buddy from teasing Cindy, threatening some kind of physical altercation. And Peter said, no, he doesn't want to, what not. Buddy says, what and, are you going to do about it? Yeah. But then, then, because he doesn't do anything about it, then Buddy Hinton calls Peter Chicken. Peter Chicken, the character's new nickname. PC. Which, uh, That's very PC. L- which led to, I think, one of the best lines of all time that I forgot we had, which is Cindy telling Peter later at home that some chickens are nice, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the reality, the reality of it, chickens are little dinosaurs. There's nothing nice about them. <laughs> In any case. They're good to eat. I get called Peter Chicken. <laughs> Peter Chicken. I have another another handle now. So dad, dad who who thinks that he can reason this out, being the Mike Brady that he is. Well, when 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 dad finds out that Peter has tried a little right. bit of reason, well, he didn't know it was reason that he was trying. That dad said, no, no, you got to try reason on this kid. And then Peter tries again the next day. Now let me ask you, did Buddy hit you on that time the first time there? Did he hit no. you? No, no, okay, no. When Peter lays out that you know Buddy's bigger than him and peter then wonders if he's a coward because he oh. really wants to stick up for cindy but you know he didn't want to fight this kid you know he didn't and that's why he's now called a chicken so right. so that's said you don't have to fight him you know use reason so peter using his dad's advice the next day runs into buddy hinton with cindy again buddy doing his same old shtick and this time we cut to peter back at home with a big shiner Uh Which gives us the option at that point to put a stake on it, which is curious to me. I mean, there was rumors about people putting stakes on black eyes. Was it close to the same color as your nose at this point? Uh, No, it was purple. Uh, The nose was just black. The nose was black. With with 
gray because the makeup over the black turned kind of a grayish dead corpse color. Kind of like, you know, Night of the Living Dead here at the Brady House. It was all messed up. Right. It was well, all messed up. But at least the Shiner, you know, drew your eyes away from the nose. So it what was is, a huge. I mean, the Shiner looked like he got hit by a truck. So what is the deal with the stake on an eye? How is that supposed to, like, pull out the uh, swelling? I just think it's something cold. And cold for a little bit. You know, it's dense, cold, and you put it on. But it's, um, you know, probably not something that every family could afford to, to use. Ice might be cheaper. Frozen peas, maybe? Frozen peas, which mm-hmm. you could reuse then because they're in the bag still. Or just give your your other eye, make that black, and then, you know, it looks like you're wearing, like, dark glasses. Now, to prove where the ba- Bradys really grew up, on what side of the tracks, or how far from the tracks, on the other side of the tracks they grew up, is that steak was Tiger's dinner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, they were living in a different place than I grew up. Oh, so. I missed that. <laughs> okay. That's what so, Alice says. So, so Mike decides, what, he's going to go reason with Buddy Hinton's father, right? Yeah. So he's going to go over there and have a talk with, yeah, okay. Mr. Hinton. So this is, I found this to be absolutely hilarious. So he goes over to Buddy Hinton's supposed backyard which clearly is the Brady Bunch backyard with more bushes, more plants, a few extra Without trees. Without a swing set, right, right. Yeah, they take out the swing set, and now it's Buddy Hinton's backyard. And Mr. Hinton, for some inexplicable reason, is kneeling in the middle of the AstroTurf with nothing around him, trying to fix an electrical box. He has a screwdriver and an electrical box in the middle of the backyard, and Mike Brady says, Hi, Mr. Hinton, may I speak with you for a few minutes? Did, I, did that strike anybody else as just being a, a bit of a stretch of reality there? Well, it did in that, that just all of a sudden Mike is in the guy's backyard. I, I know that in some locales across the country, people don't have fences between yards and so forth, which I always thought was weird because I grew up with fences between yards and gates and so forth. And the backyard is sort of like the outdoor version of someone's house. You don't just walk in. You got to knock, you know, introduce yourself, be let in. But here's Mike just in the guy's backyard. So that, to me, struck me weird. Well, but we assume that his wife said, oh, yeah, well, go go see him. He's around the back. I didn't have that kind of advanced thinking going yeah, well, on. That, that I think that's I what numb was. to that. And but then we go to the back and what's he do? I mean, it was so contrived is, is but but I, I mean, he's really into it, though. He hardly looks up at Mike, which the whole direction. Again, this was an Oscar Rudolph directed show. Mike is standing. And Mr. Hinton is kneeling on the ground the whole time, right? (laughs) And at the end, when Mr. Hinton is telling Mike to get off his property, he stands up. And he's taller than Mike. And Bob Reed was a a 6'3". So (laughs) uh, the the actor, Eric Sorensen, very familiar face, was taller than Bob, a big guy. So he intimidated uh, Mike Brady is the point here. And uh, Mike Brady came home and and complained to, to mom. And Bob allowed for an absolutely unreal moment to play out where he had been talking this whole time about uh, using discretion and, reason. and talking things in reason and talking things through. When when Mr. Hinton stands up and they're almost nose to nose, Mike looks up like at his good angel. <laughs> and, then, and then says, oh, shut up. To an imaginary friend who's advising him to just reason. Right. Nonetheless, he turns around and walks out. So... Now, um, interestingly that you mentioned this, this is pretty much the same way that your character, Peter, handled Buddy Hinton. Well, so now Mike goes home and Carol asks Mike what happened. And Mike is a little agitated at the, the nerve of this guy. He's just like his son. He could care less that his son was teasing a little girl. I'll bet Carol has a solution for all of this. Well, then Carol gets indignant and she's going to go over there and speak woman to woman with Mrs. Hinton because they'll be modern. able to work things yeah. out because women do not resort to violence no. or bullying. Women so, support women. Women are rational. Right. That's what we are getting because Carol is, right? So another yes. woman like and Carol, modern. they'll, work, they'll Carol. work things out. Carol is a modern wife, like we said at the beginning. And so she's going to just be modern about this and go over and have a little chat and everything will work out. And what happens? Well, what happens here is we find out that Mrs. Hinton is not quite the equal that Carol Brady had expected. In other words, Mrs. Hinton is completely subservient to Mr. Hinton. Like, she can't think for herself. She can't voice her own opinions. She can't do anything that is not in line with what her husband wants. And you get the feeling that if if she's not just totally dominated by this guy, she might be, like, battered. Well, you definitely, that today is exactly what you would assume. It's interesting that 
in that time, in 1970, that was not an assumption. Maybe that is what all women, or a lot of women, more traditional women, the, the position that they would take, that they don't get involved with their sons, because that's what she says about Carol's request that she have a, a talk with her son. She says, I don't get involved. I don't want to get, literally doesn't want to stick her nose in the business of her husband and his relationship with his son. But given what we and know- how to raise his, literally saying, I can't get involved with raising my own son. <laughs> yeah, but given, given what we now know about Mr. Hinton, we just kind of wonder how it is that he keeps the little wifey poo in line. Well, that's what now you would go off and recognize is like, we, she says, she's basically saying, I don't want to get involved there. I'm going to, I know what's good for me. Oh, no, I've I done that. And you literally hear her basically not saying, but you could hear it in the back of your mind. She's tried this before and don't go there again. I couldn't possibly do that. I couldn't possibly do something that he didn't want me to do. Are you? Oh, no, he has all of the answers. <laughs> yeah. So that's so, gonna, yeah. So so that kind of a, that kind of treatment would today be abusive. I think very much so. And and plus, it puts Carol and Mike in quite the quandary. Now she comes home. Mike is sleeping on the couch in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> it was it doesn't seem to be a weekend, but probably had that er, you know that after work cocktail. He was working on some thoughts about how to plumb a bathroom or something, yeah. uh, problem solving. Right. In any case, so uh, Carol comes home indignant that this woman, you know, can't huh. help her. Um, and where does that leave them? Now, uh, they, they don't have a rational parent to to deal with to talk sense into the son. So it's time for the a result show of, is show of force. Dad says it's okay to stick up for yourself. That's right. Which was really bad news for Peter, because at this point, he's showing off like he could take Buddy, but he's not thinking anything's going to have to happen from it because, you know, the parents are going to work it out. And they come back failed in that attempt, and now Peter's left to his own devices. Yeah, well, it's late in the game, but this is where Greg comes in, because Greg's going to take right. care of his little brother. Peter, come on. Come well, on. you you were going to take care of Buddy Hinton, and Dad says, no, you don't. But Peter can. <laughs> well, appropriate, age appropriate. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this is today, the way kids like Buddy Hinton would be dealt with in school, completely different than back in the day. Oh, my I gosh. Know it took a while to get expelled or even to get reprimanded. And they even swat you, you know, <laughs> in my school, there was corporal punishment that was yeah, sure, uh, I had that meted too. out by the school. And those kids aren't tolerated anymore. You know, oh my you gosh. touch another child and that's, you know, there could be... You know, charges filed. In today's schools, the faculty and administration of the school would be so all over this in a second. It's ridiculous. Everybody would have been suspended. The parents would have been called in. There would have been a talking to. Psychologists would have been involved. Uh, penalties could have been put in place. It could have been kicked out of school. I mean, it's all, like all over. This is exact. This episode is exactly why we have that now is the pain and anguish and the suffering that occurred uh, in this case with two children one getting teased the other one get, you know getting pummeled by a bully that without it and with parents not willing to step in how do you end it well you sort of end up where we're at today which That's is right. you're going to just nip it in the bud and it's interesting because this is an episode that sort of confronts it not it able to overcome it completely not the way we would today by satisfy it by proposing that well you got to meet violence with violence. Well, this is also what makes this episode unique in the Brady Bunch, because but the Brady Bunch actually takes a stand here. The writers take a stand on an appropriate way to handle this inappropriate behavior. And that we know today is controversial. When all else fails, meaning reason, violence is um, perhaps the only route to take. Like for like. So that's where Gray comes in. He's excited about the prospect here. He wants to see blood. He's tired of seeing your black nose. <laughs> he wants to see blood coming out of that nose or Buddy Hinton's, one of the two. So we're going to teach you how to box. Now, I have a question about this. Now, when we came down and I'm trying to, you know, kind of keep you in this mock ring in the backyard on the AstroTurf and dad's watching and you were, I mean, you had the moves. You were dodging and moving and dancing. It was moved like a butterfly, sting like a bee kind of thing. Is that what was going on in your mind there? Because it was terrific. Yeah, when you can't throw a punch, you got to, you know, just avoid the others. You're saying Muhammad Ali can't throw a punch? No, he could. He could do both. I'm saying it, my style was I couldn't. You watch me. I didn't know how to yet throw a punch. So I wasn't really punching much. You at least had a stance and a punch. Even even Ann B had a punch. I looked at Ann B punching around. I was like, I bet you she took boxing lessons at some point in her past. So you were more, you, you were more 
move with a butterfly and learning how to sting like a bee? I would say I was sort of fluttering like a butterfly and taken off like a buzzard. <laughs> well, Making like a chicken. <laughs> I loved I loved watching Alice in the kitchen with the boxing gloves. She was hysterical. She's so good with that physical comedy, and, and she really was. It yeah. really was nice. Really, really fun to see. It made me made me laugh. Made me smile. It made me feel horrid actually looking at it now as an adult, going, yeah. "My gosh, Ann B is a much better boxer than I was back when I was twelve years old." So Not this that, thing is all know, I should have known how to box, but so this is co all coming up to a big climax, isn't it? I mean, we've we've spent uh, like the, uh, like three quarters of the show building up. Now you're tra you're a trained fighter, if not executioner, and uh, we know that Buddy's going to come through again because we know exactly where to find him by the tree on the sidewalk where Cindy always walks by, and fortunately, no faculty around ever. I mean, apparently they weren't even notified about this because all the kids kept a secret. And I all think they were invited to the fight and they just didn't come. Now, here's another thing that I liked about this episode. When the showdown is coming, you're escorting Cindy away. Buddy Hinton is waiting for you to come by so that he can uh, ramp it up. Half of the school comes with you, all our classmates. And we have a very diversified group of students. And one of the few times that we had people of color, we had South Americans, we had Mexicans, we had all kinds of people here representing, you know, a good mix. And it was, it was nice to see on the Brady Bunch. They didn't step in to help, though. But they were cheering for you, Peter. You know, you can't have everything. They were cheering they for were. you. They how, were. How come they were there? Because Cindy... Yeah, well, because I'm sure that Buddy Hinton told everybody that the big showdown was going to happen because he thought he was going to knock you out. Oh, he doesn't know there's a showdown about to happen. Cindy does because she knows what's gone on at home. And now we're down to the point where reason's not going to be had. And so the next step is to fight fire with fire. She knows that. So she invites the school to come witness the fight. Now, Buddy Hinton probably doesn't know that he's in a, in a fight because he's used to bullying. Right. So when he finally says, make me and Peter. OK, you still try. And he hands his books off. It's like that would be today the moment that would make the bully kind of go, what? You what? You still tried to reason with him, but you did hand off I, your books and you got yourself ready. Turn around right. and, and just just take it from there, Chris. Tell us what happened next. I, I, it was a blur. I don't know. And I <laughs> do know that they avoided actually any kind of photography that would have allowed for any kind of buildup. They did cut away. That's for sure. Peter closes his eyes. Yeah. And right. swings. And? And the next thing you know is Buddy Hinton's on the ground and and he's lisping because he's had a Guess tooth. Guess who has a lisp loose. now? Look, at it's tooth. coming around on him. Mm -hmm. And what happens? Everyone teases him. Now, in the 60s, we called that karma. <laughs> it's karma still exists. It still yeah. exists. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, so we feel good. Drama loves when there's some karmic retribution. Mm -hmm. But what I thought was very telling about the Peter character. They probably got this from me, the person that I was, was he didn't want anybody teasing Buddy. Not only was he courageous, he was noble. You were a hero. Um, that's all I can say, Chris. Peter I, is a hero. I'm realizing that was much more to Peter than I knew of. You like, should be it was proud. more to Peter than there was to Chris. <laughs> you should you should be proud. Well, listen, they, they they come together in the same package. So there you go. So and what happens next? So now, you know, Buddy's got a loose tooth on the ground and running away because people are teasing him because of his lisp. Mm -hmm. And then we button up the show. Yeah, do tell. Buddy Hinton comes to the door. <laughs> They let him in before even knowing who this kid is. Of then course. he introduces himself as <laughs> Buddy a, Hinton, and they're, they're wide-eyed. That's another thing we do in the 70s. You don't ask who anybody is before you let him in the house. You just let him in the house. Then he announces himself, and oh boy, Carol and Mike know who it is now. And I don't believe there was ever an utterance of anything approaching an apology. He just asked for Cindy's tongue twister book. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's like, can you help me? You know, it's like, would you want to apologize first? Do you want to, you want me to bring Cindy down so that uh, you can say that you'll never tease her again? What did you, they missed the whole beat about it. Like, you know, the kids probably got a fixed tooth and it's still teasing little kids. <laughs> so what is the moral of this story? This is, it's not easy to figure this one out. I, you know, we could take a stab at it like for like. In terms of uh, force, uh, sometimes words can precede actions, but sometimes you got to take action. Might sometimes makes right. <laughs> sometimes you, know? you just got to ultimately put somebody in their place. But nobody ever said anything about going to like the uh, the principal's office or the school faculty and saying, "Hey, you know what? We got a problem here because this kid is tormenting 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tormenting yeah, and my that daughter. Would be the show to, that would be the show today. There'd be a lot more adult intervention. And don't we know it would be a lot more boring today? A lot, a lot less bloody. Well, that is exciting. Now, I would go home and continue to fight with my brother for yeah. the next wow. five, six years. Yeah. So, so I expect that we will begin to see disclaimers on the airings of our shows in uh, various places. Like, These are Brady children. Yeah, not suitable acting for, for the young comedy. Adults. This uh, is not a yeah. way to raise your children. Yes, we don't. Not a way for your children to act. The views are not expressed are not necessarily those of the network bringing you the show. <laughs> these these are trained professionals. <laughs> Do not try this at all. <laughs> yes, all all of the injuries were done by makeup except for Chris's nose. <laughs> uh, this is what can happen to you in real life. That was You'll have a black nose for another two weeks. Well. I think well, I've, there had, you go. I've had at least as much fun going back over this episode as I did uh, filming it. <laughs> a fist full of reasons. Fist and full of reasons. There is a reason or two to use your fists, ultimately, I guess. All uh, right. The well, listen. Moral of the story. Let's wrap this one up. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is uh, Barry Williams and Mr. And I'm Christopher Knight. I was Greg. He's Peter. And we are the real Brady Bros. My name is Diego Shika Luke. I'm 23 and I'm making a podcast with my mom, Lori Stern. In 1999, I was adopted from Guatemala. Lori always made sure I knew where I came from. And as a journalist, she documented everything. But she had questions about what it means to take a kid from one culture to another. And for my birth family, other adoptees, and myself... I need to answer some of the most difficult questions about adoption and what makes a family. Listen to All Relative Defining Diego, available now. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts to binge all episodes or listen weekly wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. O'Reilly Auto Parts specializes in keeping your car on the road. Not sure how much life is left in your battery? Our professional parts people will test it for free. If it does need to be replaced, we'll help you find just the right one to fit your car. Our superstar batteries are built to handle even the toughest conditions. Visit O'Reilly Auto Parts today. Oh, 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 O'Reilly.